Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Jeff Edwards. I'm a UW Extension Educator for uh, uh, University of Wyoming. I'm talking over <laughs> myself already today. This is, uh, this is Barnyards and Backyards Live. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, with us, my co-host today is Jeremiah Vardaman. Good morning, Jeremiah. Good morning. He, he is an Extension Educator up in Park County, which is the Cody Powell area of Wyoming. And our guest today is Mary Louise Wood. She's a 4-H educator in located in Laramie, correct? Yes. Uh, I think, yeah. okay, all right. I'm, I'm having connectivity problems today, so uh, we'll make do with what we have. Also in the background today is uh, uh, Jenny Thompson. Uh, she is the one who keeps us on track online and mostly out of trouble, I think. Um, so uh, it, with that, I uh, want to add a few other things that it, um, if you are new to Zoom or frequent user of Zoom, if you scroll over the top of Zoom with your mouse, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom uh, or a chat button. If you have questions for us, please use those to uh, interact and we will get to your questions uh, as we can. And then and for those of you who are following on Facebook Live, please use the comment area and uh, Jenny will filter those questions over to us. So today our topic is goats uh, and Mary Louise is our person who uh, is going to provide us information on goats. So uh, before we get started, Jeremiah, you are going to have a wet ear after today's presentation uh, based on where that goat is poised for. So um, Mary Louise, if you could uh, uh, get us started, let's talk about goats today. Sure. Let me share my slides if I can. Jen oh, thanks, Jenny. Okay, so today we are going to talk about goats. Uh, I don't know if Jeremiah or Jeff have goats, but I do have goats. I'm not an expert by any means. I do have some good experience, some bad experience, but I do know a bit about goats. And, but and if somebody's of... wanting to be involved with goats, they kind of need to decide, what do I want goats for? So there's a lot of different kinds of dairy goats. Here are Sonnen's, um, an Alpine, a La Mancha, a Nubian, and an Oberhalsey. These are common dairy goats. Um, and even within dairy goats, you need to decide, do I want a lot of milk? Do I want, um, do I want a quiet goat? Because some goats talk <laughs> more than others. Okay. Um, that type of thing. Mary Louise. So, Mary, can sorry you, to interrupt. Yeah. Can you, can well, you give right. us a concept? Can you give us an idea of how much milk is a lot of milk for a, for a goat? Okay. Like, so here on the slide, a Sonnen, they go from production. So a Sonnen has, like, they'll provide uh, a gallon of milking. Okay. And which one's the Sonnen? So the white one, the the very first one. Okay. Okay. And then, so then it goes down in production from there. So Alpines are also huge producers. Uh, so are La Manchas, but then okay. toward Nubians and Oberhalseys, and then on further, there's Toggenbergs and there's more breeds. Um, they don't have as much production. Uh, like the Oberhalseys they may do like a quart of milking and they're just and like cows. You milk them twice a day. Uh, so that quart, is that quart per day then? Uh, per milking. So you'd get a quart per in the milk. morning okay. and a quart in the evening. Um, unlike, okay. Great. Unlike, unlike dairy cows, uh, goats do not produce as much cream the they'll have oh okay depending upon the breed they'll have more butter fat so like your saunans that ha are heavy producers they're also going to produce more cream than your oberhalsey okay. so kind of like 
you know, a, a, a Jersey versus a Holstein. Now, so what does that do to you uh, in terms of if I want to produce butter or, or cheese or anything that way off of that cream? Uh, well, you'd need, you'd need more, more goats so okay. that you would have the cream. Um, generally, for the home producer, when they make cheese, they're usually going to make a probably a soft cheese just because of the fact that you don't have as much cream. You'd need more goats oh. and, you know, like you might have to store it a little bit longer before you'd be able okay. to make cheese. You can make, you can make the harder cheese with the, the renin, but usually it's more like a, um, a cream cheese that you make. Okay. Or, okay. So Mary Louise, we have a neighbor who has goats and she has a goat dairy and she produces a cheese she calls a chev. Which right, So, but it's a softer cheese, isn't it, Jeff? Yes, it's uh, spreadable. To me, that's what I think right. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah um, it, I, I, I do have a question. It's very easy. I do have a question for you. Okay. Um, you know, based, looking at the people showing the goats. Right. Is the... Is it the the white one? Is the Sonnen? I guess. Is that a is that a really large breed, or is the person showing the goat a small person? Uh, no, they're pretty good sized. Um, I would okay. say I bet you that person is probably my size. So okay. I'm not I, I'm not a, a big person. I'm only five foot two. Um, but Sonnens are pretty good sized. Both. Uh, those first four are all pretty good size. Um, like a full grown goat would probably be between 120 and 150 pounds and okay. probably be like 38 inches tall. Now the overall, the overhalsey is a smaller goat. Um, they're probably more like 30 to 32 inches tall and full grown, they'd probably be like 100 to 120 pounds. What what is the temperament of dairy goats like? Are they pretty easy to manage? Are are, are there some interesting issues breed wise or as a whole? Are they uh, hold, are hold they the, okay? Hold hold on to that thought real quick. We have a question okay. about milk that I'd like to catch before we start okay. diving that rabbit trail. So we have a question okay. from Kimberly on Facebook, and and the question is, isn't the milk more naturally homo homogenized? and why there isn't as much cream like as with cows where it rises to the top i think that the reason that there's not as much cheese or as much cream is there's not as much butter fat with uh dairy goats as there is with dairy cattle and so it is kind of more homogenized it is more mixed together but it's basically because there isn't as much cream. So it is homogenized, but yet it's not because it's just not there. It's just lower in content or a lower in amount of, of the butter fat within the milk. So they don't produce as much as cows. Right. And also, um, you know, people that are lactose intolerant can consume goat milk. Uh, so, a lot of people, not everybody, it's not, they, but they can consume goat milk versus dairy milk, dairy cow milk. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with it too. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. As far Go as back their to per Jeff's question. Well, as far as their personalities, Jeff, like they're really pretty mellow. Um, overhalsies are probably the mellowest of th these on the screen. Uh, as far as noisy, Nubians talk a lot. If you have close neighbors, they better like goats too because they're going to hear your goats. Kimberly on um, Facebook agrees with you on the talking. <laughs> I mean, we had Nubians and they all of these goats have cool personalities. Um, but Nubians are talkers. If you look at the center goat there, the black one, that's a La Mancha, and it looks like that she doesn't have ears. Well, she does, but th 
they're little. And so they just have like a little ear flap. And whereas the Nubians have the, the long hanging ears, um, Sonnens and Alpines and Oberhalsies have erect ears. Hmm. So, but a lot of people think La Mancha's have, their ears have been frozen. They haven't, they just, they, they just have little ears. They're just smaller. Right. Yes, they are. Um, it, so it does make it difficult in the dairy goat world uh, for a registered dairy goat. They're tattooed. That's how, how their names are given to them. And where, where is that tattoo? Is it in the ear or is it, it in is, the lip? It is in the ear, except on the La Manchas. On the La Manchas, it's underneath their tail. Oh, okay. Because their ear's not big enough to tattoo. So, right. and that's their the identification list. mark, essentially. Yes, it's essentially a, their name or yep. their brand. Their in brand the, in the cattle right. world, it'd be their brand. Great. So, um, Mary Louise, which one was the um, overhalsy on your picture? The, the far one. Uh, oh, the, okay, thank you. The, the one that Spot has color. the. Yeah, so she has a. So, the overhalsy has a dark dorsal stripe. So, it's a stripe that goes down her back. Um, all your overhalsies are going to look exactly like her unless you happen to have a solid black one. Um, but overhalsies are that bay color and they have the dorsal stripe. And so actually overhalsies are difficult to tell apart. You kind of get to know them by their personality, but a lot of times you would have a chain around their neck with like a, a tag or something because they're very difficult to tell who's who. They don't Who have identification it? marks, essentially. Right. Now, like the Nubians, well, all these other ones, the Sonnens are also would be difficult because they're all white. A Sonnens always white. Okay. Um, but your Alpines and your La Manchas and your Nubians, they're going to be different colors. And so they're uh, easier to tell. Jeremiah, do you see the other uh, question from Scott Taylor. Yeah, I was just going to get to that. Thank you, Jeff. I, I was hoping Scott would join us today. Yeah, Scott uh, asked the question, can you comment please on the relative value of microchips versus tattooing? Ooh. I have no experience with microchips. Um, so I, yeah, I have no experience there. Uh, it's very easy to tattoo. Um, it's permanent. Think, you don't. You I wouldn't the, have to have a reader. Yeah, you I know, think there's trade-offs the to it, right, Mary Louise? I would it's, guess so uh, because like, you know it's kind of like the RFID tags that we use in with animals now. You still got to have a reader, and since there's different brands. Uh, you have to have the right kind of reader. And so I would assume that in the microchip world, it'd be perhaps the same way. But the one thing is that you'd have to have a reader and with a tattoo, you don't. But um, sometimes, like if you have a Nubian that has dark ears, it can be difficult to read the tattoo because you usually tattoo in dark green ink and so you may have to use a flashlight on the underside of the ear to be able to see that tattoo. Well, and, and I don't know with goats specifically, but like with cattle or pigs, they, they do tend to lose a part of their ear at times, like if an ear tag gets ripped out or just if they get fighting. Um, and so you can lose part of that uh, tattoo where it would be unlegible or, or hard to decipher. Um, and that's where a microchip might play be a little bit better but there's trade-offs and I don't know if there's really one better than the other uh, tattooing is just the probably the traditional way is that correct Mary Louise yes and I don't know what the cost of a microchip would be you know yeah, so I don't know either so if you had a handful you know it might not be a big deal but if you had a herd then it might become a big deal so I have a question for you, Mary Louise. If, uh, if a family wants to get 
some dairy goats f to supply enough milk, butter, cheese kind of concept for their own home family. How many goats kind of can fill that bill? I, I, from what you've said, it depends on breed, but right. I, I don't need many, it doesn't sound like. No, not really. Uh, like, you could have one saunen, really, and if you just had, say, a family of three or four, uh, you could probably have extra milk. Uh, if okay. you had a large family, maybe not. Uh, in our, and you're, you're not going to have butter. Uh, okay. I don't know. I, I don't think you can, you'd have to have a lot of goat milk to make butter. Um, and cheese wise, you could have plenty of soft cheese, but you're not going to have cheddar cheese to put on tacos. Um, <laughs> but it's also comparatively like a cow is going to supply you more milk, but a cow also needs more space and they also eat a lot more. Right. So you have the trade off there. And so how long is a goat in production of milk? How many days or, or months? They can, can be I... in production for like 300 days. Oh, wow. So, but it's also going to be, I mean, it's going to be, be the, the, the um, amount of milk they produce, you know, is going to vary. You know, they're going to be a heavy producer closer to when they freshen or for when they kid right. than at that end of 300 days. But it also depends on the goat. Some goats are just heavy, heavy production. Heavy yep. Um, in the registered dairy goat world, they can do what's called a milk test. And that's where they actually see how much milk they produce. And so on their registration papers, in their lineage, you can tell if they're a high production line or not. Okay. Now, there are- So how long do they the need to be- side, Sorry, Mary Louise. How, how no, long do okay. they need to be dry for before you can freshen or, or have them kid again? Well, I think for probably the health of the animal, you would probably want them to be dry for a couple of months. Um, you know, there again, it depends on the animal. Uh, you know, if you were using the goat milk, you could stagger, you know, by when you would breed so that you could have, you know, the dough, because you don't just dry them up overnight either. Um, so you could kind of stagger if you needed that milk. Sure. And then with the kid, so once that goat kids, mm -hmm. do you pull that kid off after a week or two and, and bottle feed the kid or, or can you leave the kid on the goat? and only take a portion of the milk? How, how is the kid handled in that process? Okay. So that kind of depends on what your purpose. In, in the show world, you actually would pull those kids almost immediately. You want them to get the colostrum, but you can actually you know, milk that colostrum out and then start the babies on a bottle right away. Um, and that's to preserve the appearance of the udder, because in the show world, that udder is worth 40% of the points on the scorecard. But if you're just raising goats for your own enjoyment and for production, you could, a lot of people will keep the baby um, with the moms during the day and then put them in a separate pen and so that you have a lot of milk in the morning and so you could share. So it just so kind of depends milk her out on for what, what you need in and then kick the kid mm -hmm. in. Right. Uh, okay. Yes. Great. Yes. So, and that would also vary. Um, kids do begin to eat, um, other like hay and grain, you know, at a fairly young age. So 
you know, a bigger kid is going to drink more from mom. So you might, you, you would, it just becomes a management thing then of how much milk you want. Perfect. But there's also, um, I, I don't have don't any more questions dairy on dairy goats. Okay. Okay. So what's our other option? So you may, okay, you could do meat goats and there's three main breeds of meat goats. Um, the boar goats and then the middle one there that looks like a saunin, um, that is actually a Kiko. And then the one on the end there is a Spanish goat. Um, I have no experience with Kikos or Spanish. I just know that they are a meat goat breed. Um, and I think it kind of depends on what part of the country you're in, whether you have those latter two. Um, in our area in Wyoming, Colorado, you're gonna, you are gonna see quite a few boar goats. And they're all gonna look very similar to this. Traditionally, they have a red head or maybe a black head and a white body. Um, sometimes they may be solid color, but not very often. They're, they're traditionally um, a solid head, um, white body, maybe a paint here or there. Um, meat goats are, they're, they're smaller than cattle, obviously. They're about the same size as a dairy goat. So you're looking at, they're probably like a 36, 38 inches tall. Uh, the Spanish and the Kiko might be a little bit taller, but your but, boars are gonna be, but they're, they're wider. Like all dairy animals, dairy animals look skinny. You know, dairy cows, because, they put all of their effort into that milk production. But a meat animal, they put their effort into muscle production. And muscle is what we eat. Sure. Uh, how do you spell Kiko, Mary Louise? K-I-K-O. K-I-K-O. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And boar is not like the swine boar it's spelled b-o-e-r great okay and the boar are the male goats and the does are the female goats correct no no mess that one up completely yep you did jeremiah so boar is the breed of goat oh yes gotcha okay and so the and billy the male... is a male and a doe is a female <laughs> and the boar is a breed of meat goat that is correct. So, I, I and actually, uh, we call the, the males bucks. Bucks, okay. I mean, yeah, you can call them a billy goat, but the males are bucks and the females are does. And in the babies, so you have a buckling and a doling. Perfect. But they're all kids. That is uh, <laughs> under a year. Yes, they are. Cute. And now we're all confused. <laughs> I, think we're all, I think we're all straightened out now. <laughs> so good explanation. Um, but as you can see, uh, you know, the meat goats, especially in the boar breed, like they're just bigger boned. You know, they're little tanks. They walk, uh, you know, they, they, that's their job is to produce muscle. They have a stout, more stout looking frame than a dairy goat does. Definitely. Um, you know, a dairy goat, their, their bone shape, their legs and stuff look fragile. They're not, but the size of, when you compare, like I can put my hand around a dairy goat's leg, but I can't around a meat goat's leg. Okay. We got a, a question for you, Mary Louise. Uh, what, and I'm going to expand this question, but Molly asks, what do you recommend for equipment when getting started with dairy goats? And I would expand that question to, is there any equipment different for a meat goat versus dairy goats? Well, a dairy goat, you would, you'd want to have, like, if you're going to milk, you'd want to probably have a stand. So that Milking you can stand. have, just because goats are small, 
um, so that you can have them up on the stand so that you can like sit on a dairy stool and milk, you know, um, and also so that they're contained. Uh, their head is in a head catch then, and they're usually enjoying grain uh, while you milk them. Now, with a meat goat, you don't need to have that equipment. Um, and it depends on how many you're milking, whether you would want to milk by hand or whether you'd want to get a milk machine. So equipment wise- well, Basically the big difference is just the milking equipment. Yes. Great. We have a couple comments here from Melissa off of Facebook. Most of us breed to kid one year to kid once a year for freshening and dry off 60 days prior to the next kidding. Uh, this means the freshen bred breed at seven months later, milked through to three months pregnant is what they do. The other that's comment, pretty common. Okay, great. The other comment she had, or, or sorry, com a comment from Kimberly is our Lamanche do very well here in Wyoming. They have the best feed conversion for volume of milk is what they have found. Hmm. And I think that probably, you know, just depends from place to place. Um, in my experience, uh, the meat goats are much easy keep, much more of an easy keeper. You do not, they do not need the quality of feed that a dairy goat does. A dairy goat, I mean, if you really want milk production, then you need to feed quality like alfalfa hay um, versus grass hay. Premium forages then, a premium yes. nutrition. Just and because diet. they're putting that, all of that, all of those calories into producing milk. So then when you're sourcing like alfalfa, do you need to be looking for dairy quality alfalfa then? Are you looking for the highest uh, relative feed value of that alfalfa or is just alfalfa in general good enough? In general, alfalfa is good enough, Jeremiah. But if you were to purchase dairy quality alfalfa, you wouldn't have to feed the quantity that you might of a lower quality alfalfa. Gotcha. Yeah, great. So that comment on the La Mancha breeds and um, being good for milk was in response to a question that I missed on Facebook, which was somebody was asking about the best heritage breeds to have in Wyoming to um, produce milk and cope with the cold winters and the hot, hot, hotter summers. Hmm. And a, a lot of it though, I think still comes down to personal preference. My son will tell you that he can tell the difference of the taste of the milk between the breeds. Now, I can't. Do I that. do not have such a fine palate, and so not not necessarily in my case. But you know, so it, it's kind of the same way with dairy cattle. Uh, you know, some people prefer. A Guernsey or a Jersey over a Holstein. So well, that you know, it becomes personal preference. That brings a question to my mind, Mary. Is uh, is there a breed of goat, maybe meat goat or dairy goat, that will not do well in Wyoming? That I should stay away from completely. Uh, not that I am aware of, Jeremiah. I'm sure there probably is. Um, Not okay. yeah, I because a lot of the a lot of the dairy goats are actually Swiss breeds, and oh, so okay. you know they're they're used to cold and like that. Um, so I don't think so, but there again, uh, I'm just experienced. I'm not an expert. Sure. Well, and from my understanding, goats originated in desert conditions, very similar to Wyoming, and so they can tolerate those heat and cool cycles. Um, and, but, you know, you can also uh, support them and, and benefit them with providing shelter, and it, that can be something as simple as windbreaks, right? Trees or, or windbreaks, physical 
fences or something like that or a shed just to help yeah, with the cold well, period? Yeah, well, just like any animal, you'd want to make sure that they have some type of shelter. Um, there, there, I would not... I think you'd be hard pressed to just have windbreaks just okay. because uh, of their body size. Sure. You know, I think they would need to have some type of shelter. Right. I know that you plan, uh, Mary Louise, to get into the kind of things that are needed for goat production here in a minute. Um, we have a couple other comments that have to do with the feed before we get there. Um, one is, uh, what does everyone prefer for optimal dairy goat feed besides besides alfalfa. And then there's another comment. A friend of mine with a dairy goat herd feeds 20% alfalfa. They raise kinder goats, which are crossed between Nubians and pygmies. They currently have more cheese and milk than they know what to do with. Um, yeah, kinders are crossbred that are, um, I don't know, a lot, I don't know anything about personally other than, um, they're kind of a hybrid. So they're, you know, a dual purpose. Uh, with milk production, you usually not only have hay, but you do need like a, a grain source. So a protein source. And a lot of times they do just get that on the milk stand. I mean, one, it's kind of a treat, but also it does help with their production. Great. Um, I, I did want to show you that there are other kinds of goats. So this first one here is a pygmy. So a pygmy is a, a dual purpose goat in itself. It's actually classified uh, as a meat goat, but uh, this is a, a kid. So it's not very big, but as the name implies, pygmies are small goats. Um, there's also, in the dairy world, there's Nigerian dwarfs, which are about the same size as a pygmy, but they are dairy goats. And so, yeah, their production is com comparable to their size. And also, their udders are, like, their teeth length is comparable to their size. And then the one with the four hooves up, it's not deceased. That is a myotonic or a fainting goat. And so you can have fun with them. Uh, they are classified as a meat goat, uh, but they do, when they're startled, they, the nerve response is that they freeze. They faint for a little bit. We got a comment uh, all over. Yes. What was that, Jeff? They lock up and fall over. Yeah. Yeah. It might be fun to see. So um, we have Mary a Louise comment the, in uh, our Q&A box here. And uh, Scott says, we have been doing quite well with kinders in Wyoming. They are true dual purpose and midsize, which is nice when you become somewhat older and slower. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have no experience with kinders. Sure. So what would I want a, a fainting goat for? Fun? <laughs> I <don't, laughs> no, I don't know. I, in my 4-H world, I do have a family that has fainting goats and they have crossed them because they are considered a meat goat. And so they have crossed them with like a, a dairy goat and for the purpose of meat. Um, it, so I mean, it's just your personal preference. Sure, it's an option in the other breeds as a meat, meat animal, but it has a unique characteristic to it. Yes, definitely, yes. Sarah, Mary Louise, I think you had oh. some other things for us to think about when considering goats. Yes. Well, so the, you know, the, the one thing is the basics, you know, they do need food and water. So, uh, they are unique in the fact that they don't necessarily need super duper high quality food, but they don't eat tin cans. Like people seem to think that goats 
do. Um, they do need quality feed and they need access to clean, fresh water. Um, when you're getting goats, you need to consider what kind of space do I have? Goats are a smaller animal, so they don't take as much room as cattle do. Um, that's a consideration. Uh, they do need some shelter. It doesn't have to be a Taj Mahal type shelter, but they do need a place to get in out of the wind and the cold. Um, your meat goats are hardier than your dairy goats, uh, particularly in the baby world, in the kid world. Um, when you're looking at getting goats, please consider your neighbors. Uh, like I said, the Nubians are a talkative goat. And so if you have close neighbors, uh, you probably want them to still like you. So you may not want to have 20 Nubians. Uh, a big factor that you're going to want to have is what kind of fence. Um, goats, I'm going to show this next slide. Goats do need like a woven wire type fence or panels because they can crawl under or they can jump over. So you don't want to have a short fence and you don't want to have a fence uh, also where they can stick their head through. Um, goats, I didn't talk about all, some goats are naturally pulled, which means they don't have horns, but most goats do have horns. And so in either one of these, if those spacings were big enough for them to get their head through, if they have horns, it becomes very difficult for them to get their head back out. Um, goats love to climb. And so they stand on fences. So woven wire fences are tough because they're, they're not as strong as a panel. But goats will also bend panels. They like to butt things. At least my buck likes to butt things. And so you start with a straight panel and they don't stay a straight panel. And since they like to stand on things just within a pen, they're curious, so they want to look over and see what's on the other side, even though they can look through. Um, and they can get, they're kind of heavy animals, and so they can bend the woven wire. But Mary fencing Louise, we is got really a, important. We got a quick question here. As you're talking about this, they're hard on the fences and that, but can goats, are they good alone, or do they need to be in groups of two or more? Oh, they are herd animals. So you would want to, preference would be that you'd want to have two. I mean, you can have one, um, but they're going to consider you their herd. And so, you know, you're going to want to spend time with that. So they do better with a companion of some sort. So if you are the companion and have plenty of time to spend with them, if you don't, you better have a few other companions with them. Yes. They, I, since they're a herd animal, they're going right. to be happier and their quality of life is going to be better. This um, is getting back to the fencing mary louise this is a point that i that my experience uh from neighbors and friends and family that have had goats this is one of the most challenging things with goats is keeping them where they we would like them to be um and mainly yes. because of the fencing or or their just creative ability to get out of fences for whatever reason and also they're very smart you know a lot of people are always saying, well, they climb on stuff. Well, they do because they, they, they like to be entertained, but they're super duper smart. And so they, they just, they know where to go. And so they are challenging. They do need, I mean, that's where having more than one goat helps because they'll entertain each other. Um, but I have on here, the last thing is toys. Like you do need something for them to crawl on. 
like a spool or stumps, or some people even have playgrounds for them because they, like child's they will playground? entertain themselves, but uh, they like, yes, they like teeter taws. They like slides. Um, they're just smart and they like to be creative. We got a couple um, more questions for you, Mary Louise. So sure. uh, on fences, how tall does the fence need? How tall does the fence need to be? And specifically, how about for Nigerian dwarfs? Well, Nigerian dwarfs, since they're shorter, the fence would not need to be as tall. You could probably get away with, like hog panels are like 30, 34 inches tall. You could get away with those. Um, but any of your other breeds, you need to probably have at least a 38 or 40 inch high fence because they can jump and they can jump like flat footed. They don't need to run and jump. Some of them can just jump flat footed. So it kind of depends. Um, you, it, it's better to have taller than what you need. Okay. So for Nigerian goats or, or those pygmy goats, maybe a, a three foot tall fence at a minimum. Taller would be probably a little better. Uh, but for all those uh, larger breeds, you're looking at maybe a four foot fence up to five foot or somewhere in there. Well, you could, like the cattle panels are, I think, 40 inches tall. And so that's, that would be fine. Your woven wire fencing is usually a little less than that. So if you're going with woven wire fencing, you'd probably want to go with woven wire on the bottom and then a strand or two of barbed wire on the top to help so that they don't jump. Um, Just kind of deter can, them from doing it. Yes. You can use electric fencing with them, but there again, maybe... That would be depend upon what your purpose is. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen in some communities where they have they bring goats in in the summertime for uh, weed control along um, river, you know, river banks or slopes. In those cases, usually they may use electric fencing just because of its ease, you know, you can spread it out and you can roll it back up. Whereas you can't. Temporary fencing. Yeah, it would be more temporary um, because that would be, you're keeping them in a, a confined in, environment so that you could have intensive grazing. Um, like Jeff's picture there with the goats in the trees, um, you're not necessarily going to see that in Wyoming but goats are browsers, and so they do prefer a woody plant over grass. So, you know, they do like to eat weeds versus grass, and they love flowers. So if you have flower beds that you don't want them in, then it's your job to make sure that you have proper fencing to keep them out of your flower beds and in their pen. This is a tree nesting breed. <laughs> uh, we got, I need to catch up on a few questions here, Mary Louise. So okay. you were talking about uh, that they like browse over of grasses. So uh, Elizabeth asked, besides what they can graze, what do meat goats need to eat? Do they need supplemental feed? And what about in the winter when they can't graze, what would I feed them? Okay, it would still be your purpose. Like, if you, are you wanting them to get to an, a, a certain weight in a certain amount of time, then you would probably want to have a commercial feed to go with your hay or with your pasture because that commercial feed is a complete feed. And so they're going to gain better than if they're just out grazing. It's going to, just like a grass-fed cow versus a grain-fed cow, it's going to take 
those meat goats just on pasture longer to become uh, a processable weight. Um, and as far as the winter time, yes, they, they still like to go out to pasture. They are, if they have a preference, they will prefer to be outside versus inside. Um, and so they can do fine just on a grass hay. But there again, it depends on what your purpose is. Are you keeping them because you enjoy them and you have a bucket of dough or does and you want to have kids that you raise so that you can harvest for meat? It just depends on what you're doing with them. Yeah, so if, if you're looking at this as a com commercial adventure and making money off of those goats, you're going to want to get those, uh, push the supplemental feed, push the, their feed ability, and get them up to the harvest weight as soon as possible uh, so it can be more profitable for you. But if you're not in that realm and it's more of a hobby and they're just kind of a companions and you just like having the kids around, then, then pushing that feed is not as necessary, but you want to make sure they have a balanced diet. Um, yes. Am I understanding that right? Yes. That, okay. Yes, that's my opinion. Um, you know, but you, then in the winter time, if you don't have access to a pasture, you can definitely supplemental feed them with a hay and it can oh, be definitely. a grass hay or a mix hay. Um, but if you're doing dairy goats, you definitely want to have an alfalfa hay for when they're milking because of the high nutritional demand that milking has on the animal. Yes. You've got yeah. it, Jeremiah. Great. Uh, we got another question from Michelle. Would they be happy, meaning goats, would they be happy being mixed in with sheep or two or just other goats? Are they kind of preference that way? And we had a comment. Um, I'm, I've lost it. Give me a second here. Melissa responded to that, that we have dairy goats, meat goats, and dairy sheep. They do fine together. However, the sheep cannot have the goat feed due to the copper content in it. Yes, that is correct. Copper is toxic to goats or to sheep. And so a lot of um, goats require more copper than sheep do. And so there's usually copper in a goat feed. And so, but, but goats can have sheep feed and they can do fine some of my 4-H kids have raised market goats and market lambs together and fed the market lamb feed and done just fine. Hmm. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's just like personalities of people. Sometimes they probably get along just fine and sometimes they may not get along. So in terms of companionship, goats and sheep can be together. They do fairly well, especially if they're raised together from a young age. They bond pretty well. Um, but you just got to be cognizant of what you're feeding them so you're not given a toxicity in spe specific, the copper to sheep. Yes, because you will kill your sheep. Mary Louise, okay. what about Great. healthcare in goats? Um, you know, are they prone to having health issues? Are they easy to diagnose? Are they easy to treat? Do you know anything about that? The, the, one, the one thing that, you, that, like anything that's kind of raised in captivity, they will um, have parasites. You know, they may get worms. Um, you can kind of, like, so they may get thinner you know, or you may be able to look at their gums or even their eyelids um, where they kind of get anemic. So you can kind of self-diagnose. Um, some of your commercial feeds have, a, have an ingredient in them that helps prevent worms. Um, otherwise you need to treat for worms every so often. Um, when you kid, much like sheep, you'll have, um, you can vaccinate with CD and T so, um, so that 
to help prevent against overeaters and tetanus. Um, also, sometimes they will have, um, they can get sore mouth, which is a virus. Um, they only have it once, but that's something that can be carried in your ground or like in your barn. Um, you're going to know when they have that because they have sores. Um, sometimes, you know, they may just get deficient looking. And so they, sometimes they do need minerals. And so most people just have like a mineral block or some loose minerals. Um, you can also like have baking soda out for them and they kind of self-diagnose themselves. If they need it, they'll eat it. If they don't need it, they don't eat it. They self-medicate. Um, yeah, they do. Uh, also, though, you do need to care for their hooves. Their hooves do grow, and so you do need to learn how to trim their hooves. It's not hard if you stay up on it. If, just like your own fingernails and toenails, if you let them grow, it becomes harder to correct. And also, in our dry environment, they get like really pretty brittle and it can take some muscle to be able to trim them. I think my last interaction with the goat, I uh, helped wrestle and hold a billy goat while the owner trimmed hooves. <laughs> and that's why you haven't been back fun, since, right? <laughs> why well, I haven't been back since. <laughs> yeah, that probably wasn't a ton of fun because, um, Bucks also can become quite odiferous. He was very smelly. Yes, they <laughs> uh, they think that it that they that their cologne is quite appealing to the girls, and for the human, it stinks. It was pretty potent. Mary Louise, yes. we got a couple questions for you on milk goats. So okay. Lori asked a question, what immunizations, if any, do milking goats need? Um, I would still say like they're, those kids need a CD&T, um, like when they're three days old and then a booster and um, you would vaccinate the mom like uh, you know, 30 days or so before they kid so that the kid has some immunity. Um, but a lot of people don't do that either. Uh, so there's, there's two different camps on that. Some people say that you need to, and some people say that you don't need to. But you need to immunize, give the vaccination 30 days prior to kidding. So when she's in milking, you do not uh give her a vaccine at that point well it's not going to pass on to the kid because it passes on to the kid before it's born gotcha so it's really a vaccination for the kid while it's in the womb right and, yep okay great yeah. another question is from Catherine: for milking goats how important is cleaning the udder i hear a lot of people just use vinegar vinegar diluted in water is this effective do I need to be concerned about food safety and handling the milk? Hmm. I don't know that answer. I can tell you that when we milked, so we used a, a commercial udder wipe uh, to clean the udder. And um, I mean, personally, I would err on the side of being overzealous uh you know you can also pasteurize um goat milk so you just heat you don't heat it to boiling i think you just heat it to like 140 degrees if i remember correctly and then cool it um and that takes care of most of your pathogens um it in my opinion, it doesn't affect the, the taste. 
And then also at the end of milking, you use a teat dip that you dip each teat in and that helps close the teat. It, it's a protection actually for that dough because when you milk, the, the teat opening, you know, it opens and the teat dip helps that opening close and it helps protect it from having bacteria because they do lay on the ground and stuff and it helps protect the animal from getting some bacteria in that udder. And I think in terms of a food handling practice, you definitely want to wash that udder. I don't know if the vinegar diluted in water uh, is effective or not. My personal opinion, I'd rather go with something a little bit better, uh, a soap and water or yeah. a wipe like what Mary Louise said. Um, in terms of food handling practices with that milk, cool it down. You know, if you're going to drink that milk raw, you want to get that cooled down as soon as you can. Um, it doesn't, uh, just to cool that temperature off because that slows bacteria growth within that milk. Uh, if you're going to pasteurize, then you'd need to pasteurize that first and then cool off that milk would be my understanding. But it'd be something to definitely look into and talk to your, um, uh, is the Department of Health would have that, Mary Louise, of, of those handling practices? Yeah, or even the Wyoming State Department of Ag. Yep. So we have not had a chance to talk about predators, Mary Louise, and I'd imagine predators is a significant problem with goats. I don't know if it is necessarily significant, but um, yes, there are predators. Uh, in my own experience, I watched a coyote take down a doe. Like she was the herd matriarch and she pretty much said to the coyote, bring it on and he brought it on and she lost. Um, but I would say even in your small acreages, your backyards, um, uh, dogs running loose in the neighborhood can be predators. You know, whether they're like just for fun, they can chase them and they run into the fence and get hurt or you know it becomes a sport where they can can attack so you do have predators in your neck of the woods jeremiah you could have wolves as predators or bears as predators um so much like sheep some people that have some people that have goats they have um the livestock guardian dogs or they have burrows with them for protection i mean Otherwise, you're probably going to need a, a, a setup to where they can be out during the day, but that you can protect them at night. Great. So, and that fence almost becomes a dual purpose, right? Keeping the goats in, but also keeping unwanted predators out. Yes, because, you know, your woven wire fence and your panels, I mean, that makes it more difficult for a a canine type predator to get in. Yes, they can jump, um, but pretty much if it's a fence that's tall enough for a goat not to jump out, it would be tough for a dog to jump in. Mm -hmm. And they could go under, but that would be a case of, I would say that your predator is really hungry. Okay. Um, you know, and if, like in the areas where you have mountain lions, you know, that is going to be a, a predator, um, you know, where if they were in the tree area, that would be something that you'd be concerned about. Sure. And I would guess, like, if you get into those smaller goats, like the pygmies and the dwarfs um, of those type of breeds, you might run into even a, an occasional not often, but a bobcat now and then. A larger bobcat might think, hey, I can maybe take this little guy down, especially the young ones. And also, if you're in an area like where I am, um, eagles will can, sometimes can take off with kids, mm -hmm. or I would say with the Nigerians or the pygmies. Oh, okay. You know, because the, you know, they're not very right. big. No, they are those golden eagles in particular are so big. They can just, both bald and golden eagles, but yeah. golden eagles are just the larger of them. So um, if you're in an area like that and have kids, you're going to want them to be more confined than, say, out in a, in a larger pasture or rangeland. Yep. 
and maybe have some structure that they can get under that that kind of prevents that eagle from swooping down and getting them yeah okay great what else what have we not talked about what have we missed well i think looking at my list here i think that we have covered most of them um they are fun they are cute um they have huge personalities uh, I mean, that is the, you can have a lot of pleasure with goats. They don't necessarily have to have a milk purpose or a meat purpose, but I will tell you, um, their milk is delicious. Their meat is delicious. They make a wonderful animal. So if you have them as pets... Um, it could be goat TV in the evenings. <laughs> well, you know, there is such a thing as goat yoga. <laughs> That's not for me, Mary Louise. Not for me. <laughs> well, I can't say as I've experienced it, but when you have a pen full of babies, I mean, they're very curious. They, they're hilarious because they bounce you know, they bounce around there. They just have fun. And so they can bring, I mean, you've probably seen them on the internet, you know, goats in pajamas, and it's usually kids. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, toy goats that they, they just are fun. Yeah. But I also will tell you, though, they can be a lot of work. It is not something that I would do on a whim. I think you do really need to consider uh, what your facilities are. Why do you want them? I mean, I hear a lot of people in the summertime say, I'd like to get a couple of goats to be weed eaters. Okay, then you need to also be able to confine them so that they can intensively graze your weeds. Because if you have, say, just a backyard and a couple of goats, they're not going to consume your weeds because they don't eat that much. Right. Well, so for that person that, you know, hey, I'm thinking about getting goats my first time. Do you have any recommendations for them of how to get a little bit of experience and not go all in? Uh, I, so I would start small, like, uh, you know, maybe start with like, uh, after the Big. fair season, sometimes, uh, 4-Hers have an extra goat and they might be a weather goat. So there's really not a purpose for a weather, you know, a weather is a male that cannot breed. And so they are a companion they are a pet um that would be so you could decide whether i really like spending time with this animal um if you have one or two you can see like is my property really set up um i've had 4-hers that have had goats in town that is a no-no um but if it's not one of the talkative breeds, your neighbors may not even know that the goat is there, but because they're smart, they can get out. And so then animal control will track the owners down. <laughs> and, and you want to know what the city ordinances are. Yes, yes, you do <laughs> want to know what the, the rules are. You can't just put an in transit sticker on them in case they escape and then say you were <laughs> delivering them someplace else. I, I suppose you could probably try that once, Jeff, but if it becomes a repeat offender, they would not believe you anymore. That could be its name tag, in transit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary Louise, 
I do not have any more questions for you. We, I don't see any more in the chat box. So we just want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for joining us and, and educating Jeff and I at least on goats uh, and, and sharing that out with all our clientele. Um, for that, Jenny, if you would share our, our website, uh, we just we didn't mention it in this show, but if you want to know more or want to watch this show again, please join us on this URL. It's the Barnyards and Backyards website. It's barnyardsbackyards.com. And look up on there. There's a lot of good resources on there. I think there's even some articles about goats on that website. Uh, also, there is the the show, so the Barnyards and Backyards live show, the schedule's on that that website as well you can view past shows uh shows like this we're recording we're gonna edit those minor little minor edits and then throw it up on that website so you could watch this again so if you miss something throughout the show and then uh for our county offices we always recommend if you have specific questions if you start getting into goats and are interested reach out to our extension offices and those county extension offices we have one in every county reach out to those extension educators. They have a wealth of knowledge. And if, if they don't know it specifically, that's the benefit of extension is they will reach out to people like Mary Louise, Jeff, or myself, or even down to campus to our faculty members down there and get those answers, uh, get those questions answered for you as best we can. Uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is we need your help. We need your evaluations and feedback on the show. It helps guide us of how to better serve you with these, this type of effort. So for those of you in Zoom, you will be prompted once you get out of this in the website with an evaluation for this show. We'd really appreciate it if you take some time and fill that out. For those of you on Facebook, Jenny Thompson has thrown that in, uh, a link for the evaluation in the comments for you. If you could please go to that when you have a chance and, and, and fill that out. Uh, we really appreciate it. Again, Mary Louise, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank One you, thing everyone. I wanted to add, this oh, is Jenny. Sorry, Jenny. Um, one thing I wanted to add was those of you with kids that haven't looked into 4-H, Mary Louise is one of our fantastic 4-H educators that are all across the state. And if you want to learn more about animals, your whole family can learn an about animals if you take on a project in the 4-H program. It's an awesome way for kids to develop all sorts of skill sets. Definitely. Thanks, Thank you, Jenny, for throwing that in there. The other thing with 4-H, if you're not into animals, 4-H can be for you too. They have a plethora of projects that are available to the youth. May it be rockets, may it be robotics, may it be cooking, sewing. There is almost a project for anyone in 4-H. So look them up, call your extension office in your county, get those kids involved and have them find a passion and, and explore a passion. So Thank well, you very and right much, now, Jenny. Uh, right now, also Jeremiah, um, just go to the the UW site. We have tons of virtual things right now that are oh, occurring, yeah. so you can do a lot of 4-H right at home without ever having to go anywhere, and Perfect. with simple equipment like just vinegar and baking soda, you can do some really cool science stuff. So Excellent. there's a lot of virtual opportunities right now. Great. Anything else before we close the show? Thank you again, Mary Louise. That was fantastic. Thank oh, thank you guys. It was fun. Thank you. Bye you guys you. have a good rest of your day. See you Friday. <laughs>